Um, this presentation will be available, like the slide deck will be on the website too. And you may see me present some of this stuff at other times as well. Some of it is not new because I've been talking about some of the cover crop data for the last couple of years. But I wanted to share with you, I've, we're to the end of Living Labs and we've got some more like cumulative data over three years and I want to be able to share a little bit with you on that. So uh, Living Labs, of course, we've been doing cover crops in the year before potatoes, following <coughs> tillage, comparing no cover versus cover cover crops after potato harvest, and then those like full season soil building crops or alternative rotation crops compared to what you were growing in that field in the first place. Most of the people in this room are adopting cover crops. You know, there's lots of reasons why. Number one reason is to keep soil in the field. So the main reason we should be using fall cover crops is to keep soil in the field. Everything else is a bonus. Um, but for the long-term health of your soil, the long-term viability of your farm, keeping the soil in the field is the number one reason. But we have a lot of these other things like keeping some of that nitrogen that Mario was talking about. If we have excess nitrate that's just going to leave the system in the winter, if we have a cover crop that can be there to intercept some of it and hold some of it and hold it over the next year, that's nitrogen you're not losing from the system. Building soil carbon, that takes a while. That takes time, but it's something that we can look at and something that we can hopefully build. Weed suppression, disease suppression, those are crop specific things, but we've seen some of those things as well. And then at the bottom, we talk about increasing yields. And I've been sharing some of those results with you the last couple of years, and that's something we wanted to look at in this project as well. Again, preventing soil erosion. You can see very easily which side of the field had a cover crop last fall and which side didn't. You know, the right side's got all a bunch of real erosion and gully erosion in it. We saw in our, in living labs, we saw somewhere around a 25 to 33 percent decrease in the soil that was accumulated in our, our splash pans in those trial fields where we had a cover versus no cover. And that only measures the amount of soil that's dis, dislodged from the surface of the soil at that spot. It doesn't even control, look at the amount of soil that's conserved by not having water running down the field and, accumulating soil as it's going along too. We are, Mary did a great job of talking about the nitrogen cycle and, and, and again these excess, nitri excess nitrates at the end of the season. We found that we saw somewhere around a 30 to 40 percent reduction in soil nitrate at zero to six inches where we had a cover crop versus no cover crop. And so that's 30 to 40 percent of nitrogen that's not just lost from the system because it's going to be uptake by that crop. And this is done in late October, early November. Later on, it's probably still going to take up a little bit more. Uh, and then it's when the ground freezes, it's going to hold that in, the, in the, that crop material till next spring. So that's important as well. And then when we talk about yields, again, we've seen a little bit of this data in other places. It, varies by crop, it varies by region, it varies by production system. So we wanted to see in PEI what would we see. And this is what we found. When I put all the fields together, minus a couple really wonky fields that were either really high or really low, and that had other complicating factors like somebody drove over the check with a payloader and impacted it all to hell or something like that. You know, we got rid of those really weird outliers. This is what we got. And what we got is about 3,200 weight, higher yield, where we tilled and put a cover crop in versus where we tilled and didn't put a cover crop in. And I think, you know, we got a very high level of uh, significance on that. Um, yes, there's mitigating factors. There's different crops in here. There's different crop rotations. There's you know, different timing of, of application and incorporation and that sort of thing. So I'll accept that there's variability in this, but the trend that we saw over time was generally very strong. And even in each individual year, the trend was very strong. We usually saw in an individual year, if we average the fields in that year, we'd see somewhere between 25 and 30, 35 hundred weight. And so I feel like you know, the trend is pretty decent. This is where I, I, I took the individual fields to show the differences, right? So the ones in green are grains, so barley and oats mostly. Uh, there's one spring wheat field in there. The reds are mustard or radish. 
and the two oranges are mixes of brassicas and uh, radish. So um, you can see there's a handful below the, the line. They're mostly brassicas. And most of those are ones that got seeded really late, or late for brassicas. So do they actually go down much? Probably not, but they're probably not statistically significant from zero. Like especially these ones here that are only at minus 10 and minus 5, they're probably just not statistically different than zero because the, we only got about 5 or 10% cover because it was too late to put the radish in or the mustard in. But generally, even accepting that we have some below the line, any project is going to have some that show negative response or no response, we're 85, 80% above the line. And some of them up to over 60. Now again, are those ones really 60? Probably not. But they, they show us an indication that there's, we're on the high side. So over three cropping cycles, we saw 3,200 weight yield improvement, which is at 11%. And why I think this is important is it provides some impetus for people that hopefully there's not a, sh the payback on this is pretty, you know, it's pretty good. So even if we're being conservative, I said this yesterday, if we're going to be conservative and we said, I don't believe it's 32, I believe it's 16, take, put it in half, just to be conservative. At $15 a hundred, $225, $230 an acre increase, well, to spin on barley or spin on rye or, or seed mustard with an APV seeder on your lemkin, $25 to $50 an acre, depending on what you're growing and how you're putting it on, that sort of thing. So the payback is between 5 and 10 to 1, even at that conservative level. So, and then there's all the long, the long term stuff, like keeping the soil in the field and maybe being able to terminate your legumes earlier. So if you terminate your legumes in August, kill them and till them in August or early September as opposed to plowing them in in November, that speeds up the mineralization cycle on those things, particularly alfalfa, and that nitrogen will be more available in the middle of the cropping season next year rather than late in the cropping season when you don't need it. So, you know, there's been lots of data from, this, from Ontario and other places that if you, fall, if you summer kill alfalfa, that'll be available by next late spring, early summer when your crop needs the alfalfa, not in October when you're trying to get it killed, right? Um, and then of course, preventing soil losses, preventing nitrate losses, keeping nitrogen. Can, you have, can, you, can we put a credit on, nitrogen credit on cover crops? So that, you know, for that nitrogen for the next year, and can we factor that into our nutrient management? And can we move the tillage operations up to a time when maybe you're a little less busy? Or maybe you got an extra guy and an extra, you know, an extra operator or something. The, the, the tractor's free. So lots of cover crop options. I won't go into it, you know, in huge detail. We've talked about this a bit before. The, one of the main things I'll say, the yellows are radish. The oranges are spring cereals, barley and oats. The, uh, the grays are uh, winter cereals. Once we get past the end of September, early October, your, this is where your winter cereals are basically your best tool. Early, late August, early September, lots of opportunity for brassicas and spring cereals. But once we get down here, like these are oats back here in the end 10th of October, they're pretty low, you know, and 5% uh, cover and stuff like that. So it's, if you're going to be, you know, if we're coming after potatoes, the early harvested stuff that's coming off in late September, yeah, you can get away with barley and oats, that sort of stuff. Once you get past 5th, 6th of October, you're better to start moving to winter wheat and winter rye and you're going to have more cover, more emergence that fall, and it's also going to cover over, carry over into the spring and be, you know, and when you get those, we get had that freeze thaw and heavy rains in April, May, you'll have more chance of it, you know, keeping your soil on the field then too. So again, here's your options: mid-August, early September, depending on what you're following. You're going in after grain. You're going in after, you know, forage burned down, whatever. You got loads of options. So. What works for you? What do you think you want to do? Do you want to mix a couple? Um, 
So you've got your radishes and your mustards, your brassicas, you've got, you know, the spring cereals. If you want, if it's something you're looking at actually as a cash crop, maybe winter canola or winter barley planted in early to mid-September. Uh, if, depending, if you work with somebody on grazing, you know, that's going to be more of a thing in the next few years. So things like oats and peas or kale, kale stay, stays green until past Christmas. And you don't have to put it in, a, it's again, small seeds don't put it into the big, it could be just a small amount of cover crop mix or something. That's where these mixes, so this picture on the bottom, this is from the O'Leary Road. And they got a nice catch of radish here, but you can see where they have the radish and oats, it's fully green, you know, so it, the oats filled in the holes. So, and that's only an extra 20, 30 pounds an acre of oats, so it's not a, not a big amount of oats. Once we get into September, we start running out of time for the radish around 10th, 15th. The spring cereals still do really well. And then the winter cereals, like we did some work with winter barley over the last few years with several people, including some down east. Uh, after the first of October, just not, like it'll establish well that fall, but it won't survive the spring. So if you're gonna look at winter barley, you're gonna wanna probably be middle of September, middle, like say 10th to the 20th, the latest. But your winter wheat and your winter triticale and your fall rye, those all do great uh, into, into early October for sure. And Ag Canada had some success in a presentation I saw here recently. Andrew McKenzie Gossel did it at Soil and Crop about winter peas. And er, like winter peas seeded in September, even in small amounts in a mix, when the barley and the oats died off, the winter peas stayed green and they stayed green and they stayed around all winter. And then in the spring, they're super easy to kill because, you know, you could probably kill them just by tilling rather than by herbicide. And then after the first week of October, in an average year, you're looking at winter wheat and fall rye. And fall rye, the later you go. Now you guys have in, especially the ones in the southeast, have a little bit more window than Surrey. But, you know, it's... A lot of people got winter wheat in here until the 15th of October this year, but then this was a odd year, right? Um, but your fall rye consistently in most years will still emerge well after about the 15th, until about the 15th of October. So for your later harvested potatoes, it's a very good option. And then if we look more at those, again, those soil building crops where we're looking at what are we... We're looking to build organic matter. We're looking to suppress diseases. We're looking to improve soil health. And we're interested in different crops other than what we've always been growing, like red clover or ryegrass or some of these sorts of things. And so we looked at a bunch of these different combinations and mixes over the last few years. There's, it's kind of a tale of two stories, where we compared some of these newer crops against ryegrass. We saw a bit of a improvement. Not major on yield, but a bit of an improvement, a bit of disease suppression. Didn't really see a big difference on soil health or soil organic matter, but we may not see enough difference in one year to really tell that. But we saw an indication that there might be some benefit of some of these other crops. However, in those fields, we're comparing apples and apples where there's tillage and tillage. It's happening at the same time, and then we're planting in ryegrass versus other crop, right? Where we're comparing those other crops against red clover, it was a different story. Because in most of the cases, the red clover was underseeded the year before and then not tilled in the spring. And so there's less tillage on the clover side than on the side where we put in these new annual crops. And so we didn't, I think if there's any benefit of those soil building crops, let's say those soil building crops had that same 2,500 weight benefit, we may have counteracted some of that benefit by the fact that there's one or two more tillage passes on the, on the annual crop side. So where I'm getting to is that I think if we're focusing on, if we take away things like um, targeted weed suppression or targeted um, early dye suppression or wireworm suppression, and we're just focusing more on, I want to have healthier soil and build organic matter, and that's going to give me more yield. I think you're gonna, it's more important to have a crop that's healthy, vigorous, big biomass, and lots of coverage for the most amount of time with the least amount of tillage 
And that's going to be more important than specifically what you pick. So as long as it fits in your rotation, it fits in your operations, and it allows you to keep the soil covered as much as possible, and hopefully you can decrease your tillage frequency by a pass or two, that's going to be more important than specifically what it is. That's what so far this is indicating to me. That's also what has been indicated by other trials in other places. So again, none of the crops we looked at were statistically better than the check crops for most metrics. We did see some differences in the nematodes, so they were highest in the red clover, lowest in the mustard, the radish, and the pearl millet, along the lines of what we saw in the early dying project. We need more time and more years to really see how some of these things, changing soil health and changing organic matter and things does not happen overnight. It's a long-term process. But again, I think it's more, less important what you grow, more important how often your land is tilled, and more important how many months of the year your ground is green. One specific trial that stood out from last year, we had a trial where we, the, the check, the standard was ryegrass in the field. They changed that up to sorghum, sudan grass, and mustard. It's not statistically different based on the level of you know, analysis we're doing, but we see a trend towards higher yields, slightly higher gravity, Definitely higher 10 ounce. That was probably the most, you know, the, the biggest uh, difference. So uh, the payables, that's why we had $600 difference on the payables, right? So that was on caribou russets for table. Um, so, and you know, not a great field, not a terrible field, kind of a run of the mill field, average field. So maybe there was a bit of, the mustard was in there for wire room control. We didn't really see much wire room on either the check or the control, um, but uh, this was one of the ones that kind of stood out from this year. Did it stay greener longer? What's that? Did it stay greener longer? Well, when the sedan grass started to die, the mustard still stayed green. So the potato. That, what's that? The potato. Ah, uh, I don't have that data. Was there any visual that was kind of? I'd have to go back and dig into the NDVI images. I haven't looked at that. Yet. I find in, it's been almost impossible with the availability of maps that we have to find any difference in NDVI or visual crop unless you have like a 100, 100 weight yield difference. You have to have really big differences in nitrogen or really big differences in you know crop stress that are <laughs> really evident in the end resultant crop before you see a difference in the foliage. Yeah, you might want to try NDRE because NDVI will saturate out by um, mid, um, late, or here probably late June, mm -hmm. and um, it doesn't really give me fidelity. NDRI. I was wondering though, do these uh, naturally top kill themselves, or are you going the sedan, to... The sorghum sedan grass, after it's mowed, and then once it frosts, it's it's pretty much to toast. The mustard stays green for a bit. They have to spray out the ryegrass. The following, the following spring? No. Most of them would, this would be prepared that fall. Oh, but okay. yeah. We, where we've seen a little bit of a trend is on pearl millet. And again, I mentioned before, we've seen slightly lower nematodes with the pearl millet on over three years. Some of the better, look, the the trend towards some consistently higher yields and consistently higher payouts has been on where there's been pearl millet in the mix. So compared with a check crop. So again, I think that's largely down to early dying and largely down to nematode control and that sort of thing. Pearl millets are also good in terms of their, they're good for fighting surface compaction and they're good for organic matter and that sort of stuff. But they, you know, I think that's largely where that's coming down to. They don't see much difference in the defects or the, or the payables. It's mostly down, just time to be yield improvement. But so far, this is only a trend. This is not anything to take to the bank. It's just something that we're looking at. So I'm not going to show you all the data because we don't have time and because it's basically all the same. We did eight fields over the last three years on biofumigant mustard, caliente mustard, hot mustard. Also looked at centennial mustard against conventional check crops, which was usually ryegrass or I think barley, 
stuff that we thought was going to be pretty neutral for uh, early dying, and trying to see if we saw any response. And one out of eight fields did we see any response, and that was the highest inoculum field in the trial with a short rotation. So it was loads of nematodes, loads of verticillium, and when we did the, the BI fumigation, we saw 40, 100 weight yield improvement. It was about the same whether we did the caliente mustard or the regular mustard. They both acted about the same. The rest of the fields really did not see, and that field that saw the response, Russell Burbank's susceptible variety, where we had either a field that wasn't really problematic for, or moderate for verticillium and nematodes, or a, or a resistant variety or more resistant variety was grown, no difference. Where we have seen difference is comparing alfalfa with red clover and ryegrass. I shared some of that with you last winter. Last year we finished a project up west and averaging over a couple of fields, the alfalfa out yielded the red clover by 4,200 weight and out yielded the, the grass by 5,700 weight. And I think the two main reasons for that from what we saw in the trial was the alfalfa mineralizes more nitrogen so there's more nitrogen going back to the resultant potato crop than in the other two, particularly in the grass, because there's no, not much nitrogen going back from the grass. And the alfalfa, where we had the alfalfa, we had much lower compaction scores. Penetrometer scores were up, so was a lot looser. Was it first or second year alfalfa? Right? Second year. So we did, in this trial, we direct seeded these forage crops in the year after potatoes with a, um, a bit of an alf, or a bit of a barley, uh, nurse crop, mm -hmm. and but not harvested, and then the, those forage crops were in for two full years, yeah. and then it's potatoes in the third year. Okay. And the clover was the same. Yeah, they're all, the, all treated the same. Two years. Yep. So then this was one of those biofuel fields. I picked it because it was from up here. It was from Surrey, and again, caliente mustard, ra oilseed radish, ryegrass. I mean. There's a 2,500 weight here, but it's not statistically different, and it's not different on the total yields much at all. It's more down. There was a, there's a little bit of up and down around smalls and things like that, but there's no statistical uh, confidence that there's any difference in any of these numbers between the treatments. So, yeah, there's $500 here. <laughs> between the mustard and the radish, but I, I real, like when you start doing the stats and you start looking at the variability in the samples, I, I couldn't tell you that there's any real difference there. And the ryegrass check is even higher, and so I just didn't really see any, we didn't see any trend, and this one, and there was other ones that I don't have up here that were even less response, like, like almost exactly the same yield from treatment to treatment. And the only thing that changed in those fields was the rotation crop the year before. Tillage frequency the same, fertilization the same, and everything else the same. So Ryan, what do you think about this idea of um, two bio fumigations in the preceding potato year? There was a few people that were doing that around wireworm control particularly, mm -hmm. um, and that seemed to have some impact, particularly where people have really high wireworm levels. It's a lot of soil disturbance in a year, it's a lot of expense in a year, and it's probably doable where you have irrigation, but the, you know most of the island doesn't have irrigation, and if you do have irrigation, you're not going to irrigate mustard. You're going <laughs> to irrigate potatoes, right? You're going to move your pivot around and figure things out to irrigate potatoes. So for PEI, I don't know that we'd get a lot of buy-in on doing that. And, and if you're dependent on the rainfall, timing, we found doing this trial, it was really hard to time the incorporation around rainfall and around soil moisture. Because ideally, people would have planted this mustard on the 15th or 10th of May, and we would have done incorporation on Canada Day. But most people didn't get it in then, so they got it in end of May, 1st of June, which then means we're doing incorporation in end of July, 1st of August, when it doesn't rain here anymore. And, you know, so there's not enough soil moisture, so you probably don't get the maximum effect of the biofumigation. And mustard, we found, used to always say mustard go to seed in 60 days. 
mustard goes to seed in 45 days. Yeah, that's right. You know, mustard goes to 40, 40 days if it's a good growing season. So, and if you put fertilizer on it. So you gotta be Johnny on the spot to manage this stuff or it goes at a condition and you lose the value too. So, again, I'm not anti-mustard, but it's, it's gonna have to be very targeted, I think, and figuring out where it works and where it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. On the diverse mixes, I've seen no evidence from our trials that the really diverse cover crop mixes have any real tangible benefit on soil health, organic matter, um, compaction, yield, any of those metrics. And I've even looked at a couple, we had one trial with a farmer where it was supposed to be, uh, you know, well, mixed the year before potatoes and then into potatoes. That field ended up getting put off for a year. So we ended up having the multi-season in for two years. So the stuff, the perennial in it grew up the next year. And we compared that with annual cropping beside it, like mustard or ryegrass and stuff. No difference. <laughs> I thought there would be difference. No difference. Now, again, one field. But I'm not seeing a difference. When I look at the meta-analysis of a lot of other places, and they're looking at this data, 90 to 95 percent of the studies show no benefit in yield following a diverse cover crop mix compared to a one or two species mix. So it's way more, again, it's way more important from a yield and agronomic standpoint to have a cover ahead of potatoes, ahead of your crop, that is not going to negatively impact your potato crop, so it's chosen to be suitable for your potato crop, and to maximize the biomass of that crop. So maximize how much that grows in the year before potatoes. So again, maximizing the amount of time that it's green, maximizing you know, the benefit of growing that cover crop rather than just how many seeds are in the mix. And some guys I know that have had, say, buckwheat in the mix. Buckwheat goes to seed in 40 days. So if you plant it and you don't mow it at the right time and then you start shedding buckwheat seeds and then you're dealing with that as a weed and that sort of stuff, same with mustard. There's some of the other, like, some people have been worried about introducing other weeds in those mixes, because those mixes sometimes, if they're grown as a mix and then harvested, then they can't really clean that. <laughs> so then people are worried about weeds. So just, just be really cognizant on what you're growing. And I think for a lot of people, like, I'm not against mixes, but make sure it's a mix that works for you. So if you say, oh, I'm going to put a grass and a legume and a a forb, like a phacelia or a buckwheat or something, and then you have kind of one of each, and they kind of all are doing something, that's probably as valuable as having 12 things in the mix. From what we've seen and what other people have seen. So again, it comes to what you're looking at. Compaction, alfalfa, radish, the C4 grasses, those are gonna help. Wireworm, we know, buckwheat, mustard. Nematodes, Millet is, seems to be the king here so far, but we've seen some good things with radish. And even generally a little bit lower on sudan grass. Not as much as millet, but a little bit lower. Nitrogen, you know, you know your, you know your, your uh, legumes, but alfalfa tends to be the king when it comes to the amount of nitrogen it can return the next year. But when it comes to organic matter and building soil health and building carbon in the soil, any of those could be good as long as they're done in the right way at the right time with the maximum amount of biomass and the maximum amount of green cover and the minimum amount of tillage. So looking ahead, looking at Next Living Labs, looking at AIM, looking at different trials, we want to look at here in PEI, can we really n nail down how much end credit we get from legumes under different termination times, with or without a cover crop, those sorts of things. Because right now, you ask most people, what do you credit for a legume? I don't know. You tell me 20, he tells me 40, another person tells me zero. Or just more, because I just don't. 20. <laughs> so <laughs> it's all over the map, right? And it depends, am I growing alfalfa? Am I growing clover, red clover? Am I growing an annual clover? Am I growing, am I going in after peas? Like, what are they all worth? Did I grow a cover crop after it or not? You know. Is there a test to measure that? We are going to do field scale work to try and anal analyze where we grew that legume and where we didn't. 
where we had a cover crop and where we didn't, and then we're going to alter the nitrogen rates in the next year, and we'll have some with a zero N, and that will help us trying to dial in what we think that nitrogen credit is. So, it's a lot of work. It's work, but once we have it done, and over a number of fields over a number of years, hopefully it'll at least give people with some comfort that I can bank on this kind of a range that's based in PEI, not based on Ontario or wherever else, New York State or whatever. We have already started some work on rotational grazing. Uh, we have a couple more people that are all lined up to do more, uh, where we're looking at rotational grazing in the forages in the year ahead of potatoes. So I think with this it seems to be a big thing in the regenerative ag discussion. So, um, but I know some growers that are doing this out in Western Canada and are really happy about how it's going. Um, so they are getting value out of their forages, feeding cattle, whether it's their cattle or somebody else's cattle, they don't have to go mow it, and they're getting manure right back on their land rather than having to truck manure onto their fields and all that sort of stuff. And they're seeing some yield improvements, and they think they're seeing some indications of improvements in soil health and soil organic matter. So I think that's something we're going to look at. And then what are the cumulative effects of cover cropping and reduced tillage? So again, we talked about, I said, I think there's some improvements in cover cropping, but in terms of looking at organic matter and soil health and stuff, it's really hard to manage, look at that and compare things on one year in and out. Almost impossible. But if we take something over a couple of rotations and we have a field that's managed to the nines, like maximum cover, green as much as possible, minimum tillage where we can, versus field where it's just what I've always been doing, not as much cover cropping, my conventional amount of tillage, over five years and two potato crops, can we see a difference in soil health? Can we see a difference in soil organic matter? Can we see a difference in compaction? Can we see a difference in nitrous oxide emissions? Can we see a difference in those sorts of things? So these are things we proposed as part of the Living Labs. I'm hoping that they go ahead. We will know in the next couple of months. Thank you, of course. Thank you to the growers. You guys are the underpinning of uh, AIM. You are AIM, and AIM is, takes your direction. So, and you're involved at the ground floor, and so we hope that we continue to provide value at, at your direction in terms of the types of projects that you want to work on. But thank you, of course, also to Cavendish Farms, who supports it financially, and logistically, things like grading at Cavendish Farms and involvement in some of the events. Um, and then, of course, the uh, province and Ag Canada through CAP funding. And then our living lab partners on the bottom, like the Watersheds, the East Prince Group, and Dalhousie. Any questions? Thoughts? One more question on that alfalfa clover trial. Yep. Uh, was any of that uh, forage taken off to feed animals? No. In that trial, no. It was just mowed. You mentioned about uh, tillage prior to the cover crops. Yep. Uh, why is that? Was it because it was like red clover or something? Yeah, so on? tillage ahead of cover crops where it's a, we're terminating a forage with a sod and it, we can't just, like ahead of potatoes and it's a sod field, you're gonna have to do some tillage. So whether you do it in the fall or you do it in the spring ahead of potatoes, you're gonna have to do some tillage. Most people have moved away and don't want to do spring tillage because they feel like it's too short a window, it's too risky, too worried about clumps. There's lots of reasons. So historically in DEI, 75, 80% of the acres used to be plowed in October, November and left, worked for the fall with no cover. You know, I'm talking 10 years ago. The question is, is can you terminate that sod? Can you spray with Roundup and terminate this? Till it <coughs> earlier, either by bull or plow or with vertical tillage or <coughs> chisel plow or something. Do that earlier and then give yourself the window to get a cover established to the whole fall and not have that ground red, but something that is then going to winter kill and not be an impediment to getting field operations done in the spring. Because, you know, we, you know, PEI winters, sometimes they're over in the 31st of March and sometimes they're over on the 15th of May. So you're just trying to figure out like, sometimes it's giddy up go, we gotta, we gotta get on the ground as soon as it's fit. So 
you don't want to have anything that's going to slow down that trying to get potatoes in as early as we can because we're already, PEI is already behind most of North America on potato planting. You know, majority, the day that the most potato, uh, potatoes are planted in PEI in most years is about, what, about May 20th? Something like that? May 25th? Like, that, it's somewhere in that range. That's, that's the peak day of potato planting in PEI. The peak day of potato planting in New Brunswick is two weeks before that. The peak day in Manitoba is fir first, of, first of May, end of April, you know. In Alberta, it's April 15th. So we are behind on that. So to try and make up for that, we, you know, if people want to get in as early as they can, we don't want to cause an impediment to that in the spring. But we still want to get our ground covered as much as possible. So, in an ideal world, would it be better if we were covering the ground with cereal rye and spraying it out in the spring before we planted potatoes? Yes. But that's risky for some people. So again, in this new project, I want to try that out on a few farms, see how it works. But we gotta, we got to figure, find our way through that. For most people, planting a cover that will establish and be thick in the fall, provide a bit of a mat of residue, and then stay for the winter is a good happy medium. So, that's that's the feedback I've been getting from producers, and I think that's still getting us further along in terms of again, you know, holding the soil, not impeding next year's potato crop, and hopefully scavenging some nitrates and a few other things like that. So, any other comments or questions? All right. Don't worry about it. We're done. So, thank you very much. Thanks for coming. I know it's a long morning, a lot, of, a lot to go through the brain, so appreciate the time. And, uh, yeah, as any, you can contact me anytime if you've got questions or something you want to talk about. So, you know how to get a hold of me. Yeah.